you on a camera over there. Um, if you're in the room, you'll see the same view that our people at home see up on the screen uh, to your left. Uh, the Slido code has just gone up in the sidebar uh, sidebar chat. So if during the presentation, is there any questions you want to, to ask, please do use Slido as the way to, to ask those. Or if you prefer to go old school and uh, put your comments into Teams, I have the uh, being very ably assisted by Dan and uh, Henry to my right, who will take your questions and feed them uh, feed them through. We have a panel and I'll introduce that panel to you during the Slido session uh, later on. If you can't hear for any reason or if there's some other problem, do put your hand up, wave, um, yell uh, or put a comment in the uh, in the sidebar for us. So the, the purpose of this session is, is several fold. Um, this is part of a regular um, Havering Council uh, Green Business event uh, series. Um, you'd expect us to say that sustainability is really important to us, and it is. Um, we've got our, uh, our head honcho of sustainability and carbon neutrality uh, immediate to, Im immediately to my left, who uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be inviting to, to speak in a few moments. Um, we have other presentations. Uh, I'll introduce those at the, um, uh, at the appropriate time. But firstly, we're joined by Lloyd Clark from Can Digital. Um, Lloyd is going to be talking to us about getting started on the carbon neutrality journey um, or as uh, the subtitle for this uh, that I jokingly put down on my card and was told that I shouldn't read it out was don't make the same mistakes as us or, or more particularly there are lessons that we can learn from uh, from can digital so let me hand over to uh, to uh, to Lloyd um, and um, over to you thanks Lloyd thank you very much uh, and good afternoon or evening now everyone um, uh, Henry, can you hear me OK? Good. Um, so, um, yeah, as Howard said, uh, I'm from a, a small business, Can Digital, uh, and purpose of, of today's session is um, actually taking you through what's required to get started on a, a net zero journey. Um, and uh, as Howard also said, we did make a lot of mistakes along the way. Um, it, it, it's interesting, I think, uh, for those of you who have uh, not started this journey yet, don't know very much about net zero, carbon neutrality, um, your footprint, et cetera, I may come across as, uh, as somewhat of an expert, um, but uh, I want to remove that illusion immediately uh, because I too am, am just getting started on this journey. So a lot of what I'll be talking to you about today is, is things that we've learned um, from uh, sources that are readily available uh, on the net um, that you have access to and, and can, can take advantage of. And I'll, I'll point out some of those to you uh, at the end. Um, but it really is about uh, about getting started. So um, let me quickly introduce uh, uh, you know, who we are. Uh, we're a digital advertising company. We work primarily with the public sector, including Avery Council. Two different kinds of activities. One, we place advertising on council websites, uh, public sector websites to generate income. Um, but we also buy digital media on behalf of public sector for public sector campaigns, uh, health, recycling, foster caring, uh, wide range of activities. Uh, small team, about 10 of us. Um, we all work virtually. We don't have an office um, and we are a digital business. So uh, our starting point was, well, we must be green. Uh, you know, we're virtual, um, we're digital. Uh, how many emissions can we actually produce? Well, um, we uh, we came to put aside that uh, that myth very quickly. Um, quite a lot is the is the answer, and I'll and I'll go through that. The next slide, Henry. So let me start off with you know what is net zero, and there's you're going to come a lot across a lot of of. Uh, uh, of, of different words, different uh, phrases, carbon neutrality, carbon footprint, net zero. Um, net zero really starts with a the concept of us needing to keep our temperature increases to one and a half degrees above the pre-industrial levels uh, if we want to avert 
uh, the most damaging impact of global warming. And we can already feel some of the, the impacts of global warming. It's only going to get worse. And one and a half degrees is, is what we're aiming for. We're probably not going to achieve that now, which makes it all the more important for us to really focus on, on getting to net zero. Um, so the, the net in this equation is um, a net position between what we emit on one side um, and what we remove from the atmosphere on the other side. So um, what we're trying to achieve is all of our emissions coming from green sources, not from fossil fuels, so from not carbon emitting um, energy sources. Um, so that we're not emitting uh, any new carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But when we do emit carbon dioxide, we need to be able to remove an equivalent amount uh, from the atmosphere, thereby getting us to net zero. Now, before I go further, I wanna make it really clear that our technology is much, much more advanced in terms of uh, generating green energy and using green energy than it is in terms of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So it's far more important um, that we focus on what we all can do uh, not to emit carbon dioxide rather than hoping, praying that at some point in the future, we're gonna be able to remove it all from the atmosphere. So next slide, please. Um, so there's really just a three-step process in terms of how we get started with net zero. Um, first, we need to understand where we are. So we need to measure the emissions that we produce as companies today. Uh, second, we then need to look at how we can reduce the emissions that we are generating. And third, there will be areas that we simply cannot uh, reduce and those we need to offset. Okay, next slide. So the starting point for this is the development of what's called an emission monitoring system. Now, that sounds much more grandiose than it actually is. This is a spreadsheet for, for most of us, and in Can's case, it certainly is a spreadsheet. Um, and uh, But it is a spreadsheet with the, that enables us to measure uh, the amount of emissions that we have. Um, and it is about looking at all of our activities and uh, what uh, emissions that those activities generate. Um, and there, we, you'll come across this concept of a carbon dioxide equivalent, which I'll cover in just a moment. Uh, but all of our uh, emissions are have to be translated into this carbon dioxide equivalent. Now for CAN, um, um, our EMS measures firstly um, our employee travel. Uh, we work virtually, but we do travel around. Um, secondly, because we are home workers, um, it has to measure the amount of household carbon footprint that we have that's associated with our work activities. Third, it is what we generate in terms of emissions when we place ads onto public sector websites. And finally, and you'd be quite surprised, um, it's the emissions that are generated when people view um, ads that we have placed either on public sector websites or with campaigns that we're running for the public sector. Um, now, this last bit of emissions is actually outside of our direct control, but as you'll see, because it's so important in terms of the amount of emissions that we're responsible for, we also focus on that. So next slide, please. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but just to highlight again, as you start learning more about net zero, you're gonna co come across this concept of scopes. Um, and there are three scopes. Uh, number one is what's referred to as direct emissions. Those are the emissions that your business generates directly through your ongoing activities. Second is uh, energy related uh, emissions. So electricity you consume, heating, et cetera, that you consume. And third is emissions related to either your supply chain uh, or to your consumers when they're uh, consuming your services. Your requirement uh, in terms of net zero uh, commitments is on the scope one and the scope two. Scope three is discretionary. Uh, but in CAN's case, because scope three is so important in terms of the emissions that we generate or that we're responsible for, we also include scope three into what we do. Next slide, please. So now very briefly, uh, again, another concept that you'll come across as you start to learn more about net zero is uh, this 
uh, phrase, the carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, and really what this does is it, it takes all greenhouse gases and converts them into a single measure. Um, and that measure is a carbon dioxide equivalent. So uh, there are a number of different greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide is the most important, um, but you will have heard probably of methane as well as a very important greenhouse gas. Um, instead of having all these different measures for the different types of gases, we put all of these into one measure, carbon dioxide equivalent, so we have a single number that we can work with. So as an example, in the UK in 2009, um, we had carbon dioxide emissions of 474 million tons, but when you add the other greenhouse gases in, then we reached 566 million tons of a carbon dioxide equivalent. So for a small business like CAN, an advertising uh, agency, um, the average advertising agency emits 641 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent each year. We're better than that, um, uh, 306 tons uh, per year that we've measured. I'll come back to the measurement process in a second. But still, to put that into context, one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent would take 50 trees in a year uh, to remove from the atmosphere. So for a tiny company like CAN, we would need 15,000 trees just to remove the carbon dioxide that we've created, that we've emitted, even though we are half of the industry average. So it just kind of puts into context how important it is that we're focused on reducing the emissions um, and how even a small company, uh, and a lot of us are, are small business and small business owners, um, how important it is for us to, to get on this and, and start to focus on it. Next slide, please, Henry. So our process um, in terms of, of creating our emissions monitoring system was really choosing a base year, which we did was 2020. And so in 2020, we looked at all of the emissions that we had generated. Um, so this looked at all of our travel, um, what we did through our ad campaigns. Uh, we even looked at the video calls uh, that we participated in because it was pandemic year, but we're also a virtual company. and this hybrid event uh, that we are participating in right now, even though I haven't traveled to get there as an example, um, I'm still using energy by uh, being transmitted uh, to all of us, um, you know, via video link. Um, so we uh, looked at all of this. Um, we converted that, uh, that number that we came up to, uh, up with uh, uh, times the, the conversion factors that are provided by the UK government, and that enabled us to get to our measurement of this 306,000 uh, uh, kilograms per year or 306 tons per year. Now, the vast majority of that uh, is actually related to customers viewing our ads online. Um, that's a scope three uh, uh, emission. But as I say, because it's 99% of our total emissions, we include that in our scope in terms of what we want to try to reduce um, by our commitment date, which we've chosen as 2030. Uh, so next slide, please, Henry. So then uh, after you've measured your emissions, um, and really this is just a process of, you know, for us, it was about getting everybody's utility bills, getting their, their uh, travel that they were doing by car and by train, getting the amount of time they spent on video calls, uh, getting people to estimate the footprint they have in their houses uh, and what they use for their offices. So it really is just breaking down every part of your business and uh, defining the amount of energy that's consumed um, as part of that process. Now we were able to subtract things like the green energy usage that some members of the team had uh, for their for their houses because um, that was already neutral and there were other green elements that were part of our value chain that we could subtract as well uh, but it really is about identifying these elements getting them in a spreadsheet and that becomes your base year right and everything that you do from there is measuring the emissions that you've had against your base year so for us that was 2020 um, and we're now in the process of measuring our improvement that we've had in 2021. Um, as I said our goal is to, to reach net zero by by 2030 as the company um, the requirement for companies in the UK um, is 2050, although the statutory requirements are only for listed companies right now, but it will come in place for SMEs as well. 
So final slide then, Henry. Um, kind of talked really quickly, giving you a kind of whirlwind tool, tour of what's required, what the environment looks like, the kinds of activities you'll go through. But what you really need is, is just some good advice and some calculators and tools that you can use. And here are three really good sources. Um, my suggestion is you get started with uh, Carbon Trust. Um, there's a relatively simple carbon footprint calculator that you can use as your business. It allows you to estimate uh, the emissions that, that your business will have. Second, um, highly recommend that um, everybody's a small and medium-sized business join the SME Climate Hub. Um, fantastic tools that are available there and probably just as important, there's a community of other businesses willing to share their insights and lessons learned, what they've done, uh, what's worked for them, um, and give you help and guidance along the way. Um, and then the final uh, link that I put up here is the government's conversion factors that you'll need to convert uh, your emissions into uh, carbon dioxide equivalents, CO2e uh, measures as you create your EMS. Thank you very much for that. Hope that was useful kind of to, to get your feet wet on this and uh, look forward to any questions you might have. Lloyd, thank you very much for that. Um, we have got a couple of minutes um, before our next speaker. That's not the only opportunity to ask questions of, um, uh, of Lloyd, but if there are any questions in the room uh, or online, I've put a couple of questions in uh, that can uh, on, uh, on Slido that can wait uh, maybe until um, our conversation later on. Um, any questions uh, from the room for, uh, for Lloyd? Uh, right, so question, uh, Lloyd, uh, is there a target date by which businesses have to have their calculations done by? Um, no, everything is guidance, but in, unless you're a large company and then there are dates, um, uh, well, there are proposed dates that all listed companies uh, will have to meet. Um, I'm not aware of those. I'm, I'm kind of focused on the SME side. For SME, everything is, uh, for SMEs, it's all guidance right now. Um, so the overall requirement is net zero by 2050. Um, that really does require that uh, in the short term, we start to, to look at it and measure it. Um, but there, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, there are no statutory requirements in terms of when you have to have your measurements in place. Uh, I will say, however, that uh, because you know sustainability is becoming uh, very important for our consumers, um, the the quicker you get started on this, and and the quicker that you're able to project that you're actively involved and you have ambitious targets to to reduce your emissions, uh, I think it's a it makes it's a really sound business move uh, to be thinking and actively uh, planning for uh, net zero. Lloyd, have you been able to uh, to work out the the positive fiscal impact on your own business because of your association with this important cause? Well, I I, um, I can't put uh, pounds and pence against it. However, uh, we you know we we do a lot of tendering for public contracts, um, and it's fairly common now that uh, as part of the social value today, it, it will be more it'll be more specific to sustainability specifically going forward. But it's more generally in terms of social value today. We make a very important point of it. Um, we we believe in it. We think this is something that everybody should be doing um, for us for our children. Uh, for our grandchildren, um, so yeah, we we, uh, we we put it in there, and we get good marks uh, for uh, for the activities that we have going on. So, so I can't give you an actual pound amount, but but it's been positive for the business. Lloyd, we thank you for that. Um, your slot is up. More opportunity for questions later on, and I'll come back to the two questions uh, from Slido that uh, that I put in. Um, our next uh, slot is to. Uh, our esteemed hosts here this evening um, at, uh, at Quantum Towers, um, uh, Finance Director um, Maria Ganella, um, and also uh, Lloyd Bevan from uh, uh, Dakin Group. Um, 
uh, you've had quite your own journey, um, haven't you? Um, I'm just going to hand over the floor to, to you because I know that uh, uh, you've got some pre prepared words for us all. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm really pleased that so many of you could make it in person. Uh, to give you a very brief overview of our company, we are the first sustainable home centre uh, for renewables in collaboration with Daikin that was opened by Lord Callanan, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State that's on the periphery of Greater London in the Havering Borough. We have just opened our on-site training facility here for the upskilling of heating and plumbing engineers to facilitate the change needed to heat pump technology. Our ethos is very much on social value. We employ locally and work very closely with both Havering Council, London Borough of Barking and Dagenham Council, and of course our local construction colleges, which is where our future workforce is held. How fortunate are we not only to have the largest construction campuses in Greater London on our doorstep, but we also have an innovation centre, see me, literally up the road from our premises. We could not be luckier. We provide integrated renewable solutions to both the residential and the commercial market. We have a team of in-house technical designers so that we can specify, supply, install and commission. And we hold MCS accreditation for both design and installation purposes. We are on the Fusion platform for council tendering and for the regeneration and refitting of our local boroughs. Over 90% of UK properties have gas or oil central heating systems, with only 5% of homes that have an EPC rate of A or B shows that 95% have an inefficient energy performance, which in turn leads to high carbon emission. The future proofing of new builds has been set in government legislation from 2025. From this date, no boilers will be allowed in a new build, meaning that we have to act now with the upskilling and training. By 2035, gas boilers will be phased out completely, and the UK has become the first major economy to pass a net zero emissions law to bring all greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050. Currently in the UK, there are 135 registered heating and plumbing engineers of which only three to 4,000 are heat pump trained. We as a business are determined by upskilling to help fill this void. Training and upskilling should be available to all, whatever financial background, especially at the moment with the energy crisis pushing household bills to a level never experienced before. Of course, we are a private company which has overheads and staff, but with the help of the GLA and their skills boot camp, this will mean that our training facility will be available to all. Having enough installers to be able to install heat pumps to a high enough quality is a key barrier to overcome to enable and achieve government target. At this rate, by 2070, our summer temperatures will be 5.4 degrees hotter, our winters 4.2 degrees warmer. Sea levels in London are set to rise up to 1.15 metres in the next 80 years, with an average summer rainfall estimated to decrease by 47% by 2070. So you can see that we have to act now. It is imperative that we act now and we all play our part. Government has committed that 600,000 heat pumps are to be installed by 2028, with a further target of 1.2 million installations by 2030, Heat pumps are 300% more efficient than a conventional boiler, so you can see there is much to be done. But this change is ultimately inevitable and is required to achieve a more positive energy efficient future. I could not be prouder than to have our association with Daikin, a company which is market leader in heat pump technology. It has gained BES 6001 certification unequalled in the UK or globally by an HVAC manufacturer with their focus being more than just source of materials, but looking at issues such as, such as responsible sourcing of copper, environmental management of systems in the supply chain, business ethics such as health and safety in factory works in China, life cycle assessment. It resonates so much with me and fits so well with our ethos of social value.
With the transition to R32 refrigerant, we have been able to reduce the material content of copper and aluminium by 20% and refrigerant by 37%, but again, so much work is still to be done. But it can be done, and with the help of our councils and our local businesses, we can make the change. We can make things happen. We can create our tomorrow. If I can now pass over to Ian Bevin from Daikin, who will discuss further from a business perspective what needs to be done. Um, thanks, Maria. Uh, evening, everybody. Um, first of all, thanks for inviting me along. Um, you've probably guessed from my accent I'm not local, um, so I'll, I'll offset as much carbon as I can uh, later on. Um, my name's Ian Bevan. I'm the commercial director at Daikin UK. Um, thanks, Maria, for those, uh, that warm welcome. You, you, you know more about Daikin than I do now, which is a bit of a concern. Um, yeah, um, Maria's asked me to come along just to talk a little bit about how we're working with businesses as, as Daikin, uh, as, a, as a big business as Daikin. And I just really want to set the scene a little bit. So uh, my background is um, I had my own plumbing and heating contract in business. Um, a, a, a good few years ago, and, and prior to that, I used to work for a, a major boiler manufacturer. Um, but I left the plumbing and heating contracted business because I wanted to move into this 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 area of sustainability uh, and, and 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 low carbon. And that was about twelve years ago. Um, and and at the time, thought this will be should be quite straightforward. And realizing it's a much bigger challenge than um, than perhaps all of us realize. But as as Maria said, it's a it's a challenge that. Um, it should be a challenge, but it's a challenge that that we can all overcome. It's certainly a challenge that we can't ignore. Obviously, close to home for us, we work very much in the heating and cooling sector. So that's all buildings, domestic buildings, commercial buildings, semi-commercial buildings. But that's a big area where we can really try and reduce uh, reduce carbon. So just to set the scene a little bit, and just to probably give you an idea of perhaps how sad I can be, um, for those of you that you may or may not have, um, and I've certainly started reading the the Committee on Climate Change uh, Progress Report, uh, which was which was published in June, which every time those reports come out, you you, you sort of fill with a little bit of joy and then fill a little bit of oh, we're still behind, we're still behind where we where we should be. And um, emissions unfortunately rose in 2021 uh, compared to 2020. I think mainly because we were coming out of COVID, so we would all be at home, not travelling. Now we're starting to come out, and we see those emissions climb. But um, the, the the report really focuses on a number of key recommendations of, of what we can and what we should continue to do to try and stay on target for, for net zero, as, as Lloyd mentioned, uh, 2050. There's 37 key recommendations. I'm not going to go through every one. You'll be, you'll be pleased to know, but there's four in particular for, for our sector that sort of there's many, but there's four in particular that, that jumped out um, for me. And the first one is for me, the, the, the carbon challenge, one of the reasons why it's such a big challenge and Maria mentioned it is the 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 rising fuel prices. So from a heat pump perspective, moving residents and business owners from gas to electricity is is still a challenge in the UK. Um, I was I was on a meeting this morning with the Sustainable Energy Association, and um, we had the Welsh Assembly there, um, and they're estimating that with the continued rise in fuel prices, around 45% of the population in Wales could be in fuel poverty by the end of this. By the end of this financial year, which is a frightening, and you know, it's nearly half of the population of Wales could be in fuel poverty as these as these fuel prices rise. Um, so one of the one of the recommendations from um, the Committee on Climate Change is, is the reforms for electricity pricing, and and I think it's crucial as we move forward that we have to see more balancing of uh, electricity and, and 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 fossil fuel pricing. So we need to remove the legacy policy cost from electricity for all those. Sort of early adopting low carbon technologies, which are all stacked on electricity, and start to share those out between you know the the fossil fuels uh, and 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 the gas and, and and LPG and oil, and I think that has to happen if we really want to advance uh, in net zero carbon. Um, the second thing that jumped out to me was really to launch. There's been a, a fairness and affordability call, which ties in with what we we're saying about fuel prices. Um, so to implement those plans for electricity prices uh, quickly. And, and look at carbon pricing. Um, so how can we start to look at uh, building in levies and costs for how carbon strong, you know, the fuels or the energy that you're using is compared to other people who might be using uh, like can digital, you know, more or less uh, carbon uh, approaches. And the plans really should ensure that heat pumps uh, compared to gas boilers 
become cheaper to run. Uh, and and what they what the committee on climate change is saying that that should happen now in 2022. So I mean we're already nearly halfway through 20. In fact, over halfway through 2022. So you know the clock is ticking there. But that's again equally important. Um, the third one is to to publish and finally publish the plan for what they call the market based mechanism. So the government are encouraging um, heating manufacturers, so particularly boiler manufacturers. Um, and, and maybe considering putting uh, levies and targets on boiler manufacturers to produce numbers of low carbon heating systems to try and force that market and, and really drive that market onwards. Um, it's It's been in consultation. We are certainly talking to people like Bayes uh, about it at the moment, but I think the important thing is putting something in place is how we track that policy. It's okay to put it in place, but how can we measure that it's actually having an impact? Is it is it is it really driving that market? And then finally, really, um, with the, the fourth one that really jumped out to me was uh, publish policies where um, homeowners, private homeowners in particular, have to reach minimum EPC band levels, um, and and they should be much stronger than. Currently, it's sort of a voluntary thing, you know, try and reach EPC band level C in a private home occupier. Um, and it's it's pretty much a voluntary thing. Um, their recommendations that we need to strengthen that so that the EPC should be seen at point of sale of your property. And that should be a minimum uh, EPC band level C or it should be uh, available. Mortgage lenders should really only be lending mortgages on properties of, of, of those EPC levels. And again, their recommendation is that should come in, at, in in the first half of 2023. So a massive amount of work to do. These things are challenging, but I think these things have to happen. And, I, and I, it's 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 no longer a choice, really. We just need to we need to be getting on with this and we need to move a little bit quicker. They, they also mentioned two major well, four major risks to delivery, two of which I picked out. Um, one is public engagement, um, you know, so public awareness um, about climate change. The public generally now are far more engaged with climate change and, and they, they're quite happy to be involved in taking action uh, and, and, and really pushing that action. But it is still really difficult for them to go and find out, you know, what can I do? It was interesting listening to Lloyd. Um, you know, what can I do? How can I go about it? Even things like I want to change my heating system. You know, where do I go? Where do I get that information from? So that really jumps out that, you know, the public awareness um, is something that we still need to continue to focus on. And then skills. Maria mentioned training for installers. You know, skills is is a, is a, is, a, is still a big barrier. Um, I think we're looking at an industry that's been built up over the last 50, 60 years. So our skill set, our infrastructure, our knowledge is all based around high carbon fossil fuels. And we, that's been built up over the last 50, 60 years, and we want to try and change it in the next 10. So again, it, it's a huge challenge, uh, but the skills, uh, the skills are, are really important. So these are the things that jumped out to me so far as I've read the 624 pages on the Committee on Climate Change report. I haven't read them all yet, obviously. Um, but then also it, it seems to be a time of year for reports. MCS, uh, and again also Maria mentioned, um, they published a report called MCS Renew in Britain, which is quite interesting. And by the way, stop me when I get to 15 minutes because Maria and, and uh, Chris have seen me talk before and I can go on a little bit. So feel free just to you know give me the shepherd's hook. Um, but the MCS Renew in Britain report is is interesting and it's worth a look if anybody's you know if anybody's interested. Um, Maria mentioned the 135,000 plumbing and heat installers that exist in the UK, um, you know, which is a which is a, a big number, um, and are currently about 1,300 companies read in MCS accredited to do install heat pumps. So again, if we look at consumers, you know, where do they go to get that advice? My father would pick up the phone to his local plumber, even though I had a plumbing and heating business, he wouldn't ring me, he'd ring the local plumber up the road um, to change his basin, to change his boiler. He, he can't, that local plumbing and heating engine doesn't have that skill set. My, even my father now is interested in having a heat pump, but where does he go? Again, he won't talk to me about it, but where does, where does he go to, 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 you know, to speak to somebody local? Um, but there's some, interest, there's some encouraging signs from MCS in terms of registered installations. There were 43 only 43 registered installations in 2008 um, for all technologies. Um, we're now at 1.2 million um, registered installations uh, at the back end of 2020. So we are going in the right direction. Um, heat technologies and air source heat pumps are mainly used still in rural and, 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 uh, and, and sort of maybe some slightly semi-urban areas. 
the Scottish Highlands and Islands have quite a big percentage of, of uh, low carbon heating um, and probably the highest percentage in the UK. But we've got to try and make that more common throughout other areas of the UK. Some urban and semi-urban areas are bucking the trend a little bit. Um, probably the closest one to here is Enfield. Um, Enfield uh, at the 11th, believe it or not, the 11th highest percentage of ground and, and um, water and air to water heat pumps in the UK, which is surprising when you think of the area that Enfield is. There's not a lot of rural idylls in Enfield, I don't think. I could be wrong. I hope there's nobody from Enfield listening. Um, but they, they, they have the 11th highest number of heat pumps, you know, here in the UK, which is, you know, it's, that's, that's an impressive figure. Um, air source heat pumps is still the single most installed renewable heat technology. And again, if we, Lloyd's uh, uh, mention of the, the amount of tons of carbon that the UK was emitted back in 2009, um, there was four heat pumps registered in 2008 uh, in the UK, that huge number of four. I think I probably might have sold all of those. Um, um, and in 2019, there was 83,210. So we've grown, that number's growing nicely. Not growing quick enough, um, but it's growing nicely. So the bigger challenge as it is, the, the, the signs are, you know, going in the right right direction. And really, I just wanted to run through that to, to give us a bit of scene setting of why we at Daikin are really pushing the sustainable home centre concept, um, the reasoning behind it. Um, so Daikin, and again, Lloyd mentioned a, a reduction plan, um, and, and Maria certainly mentioned some figures that even I wasn't aware of um, that Daikin are, are working on. But Daikin Europe, who, who we work for, um, we have a four point plan for for now, um, and that's to reduce our carbon emissions by 30% against our uh, 2015 levels across all our factories, which is across the whole of Europe. Um, so that's our first target. And then reduce by 15% the carbon intensity of our supply chain, because as well as our factories, again, as Lloyd and Maria mentioned, it's the supply chain that we use and, and where that comes from. And, and they're clear well-identified hard and fast targets that, that Daikin across the Euro, across Europe um, are, are working to it. And all of us as employees have that drilled into us and we know that's 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 where we need to look. Um, the second point is we want to drive this transition from fossil fuels to, to low carbon fuels. So things like heat pumps, which is obviously that's what we do, but um, as well as how we heat our buildings and our factories and how we drive that and enhance the circular economy. Uh, Daikin have developed something that we call Loop, which is basically recycling uh, refrigerants and reusing refrigerants in our new products, recycling mm -hmm. copper, et cetera, that, uh, that Maria mentioned. And so that Loop circular economy is, is a key part of, of, of how we go forward. Um, we'll continue to advocate, advocate policy uh, and legal frameworks, not just here in the UK, but, but across Europe. Because because of the things that the, the Committee on Climate Change mentioned, you know, that's a, that's an area that we have to, you know, people like Havering Council, Barkingham, we have to keep pushing that agenda. We have to keep annoying Bays and, and Number 10 and uh, the Welsh Assembly and Scottish Government that, you know, we need to move quicker. Um, and then really um, the final one for us is we've established a, a green, green Hearts office programme. So again, all our offices. Not that they're very full at the moment and haven't been for a while. We're still a bit half and half, um, but we we have the Green Heart Office Programme, which again all the employees uh, are familiar with. That it, it it sort of drives how they behave in the office and 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 how they work in the office, um, and so that sustainability really is at the top of uh, the organisation's thoughts, I guess, and and it has to come, you know, right from the MD down to. Uh, the, you know the cleaners and and everybody has to know this is this is this is what we're about and this is how we follow yep perfect so that just leaves me one minute um which is perfect timing really just to back up um what maria said so daikin have invested in uh, sustainable home centers and quantum here was the first one that we we launched as we mentioned with lord callanan but it addresses a lot of these items so where can consumers go to get advice they can come to a place like quantum they can see the kit, they can hear the kit, they can get advice from Chris and Maria and the team here. Where can installers go to get the skills? They can come to a place like Quantum, they can get trained, they can get the kit, they can get support. Um, where can specifiers come to find out more about how the technology suits their buildings? Again, uh, a place like Quantum. And, and so we can send consumers here, they can get the right advice, they can see the products, they can get a price to have kit installed, they can get the support and the backup, but as well as consumers, 
we can also send uh, installers here to, to get that skill set. So Daikin are continuing to promote the sender concept. We want more companies equally as professional and prepared as Quantum to, to really take that forward. Um, and they will become you know, the core of our, of our business moving forward. So um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's just about me, I think. Thanks, Shane. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Daikin's impressive commitment there to um, to sustainability. Um, a nice shout out to Quantum, other manufacturers um, of, uh, of course, uh, available, but then why would you want to? Um, and you certainly don't get uh, as good uh, cheese and wine from, uh, from other suppliers. Um, we are now out of time on uh, Maria and um, uh, and um, um and ian's uh, segment uh, but that doesn't mean of course that there isn't an opportunity uh, to uh, to come up with questions through uh, through slido or in the room or on teams uh, so keep those questions uh, flooding in i'm going to hand over to uh, nick kingham who is our head of mission for carbon neutrality and sustainability i've just made up that job title for you do you like Fantastic. that Fantastic. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, from uh, Havering Council. So he wants to tell you about the story so far and what next um, as far as uh, our sustainability mission uh, is concerned. And we're particularly interested to, to hear from you in influencing how that uh, develops. Are they on there? Thank you, Howard. Um, I think they always say don't work with children, animals or an eloquent, passionate Welshman because you've got to follow that, haven't you, really? Um, but there you go. Good evening all. I hope you're all keeping safe and well. And firstly, I will apologise to those people who've heard what I'm about to say before, but at least I can say I'm consistent. I'm always pleased to talk about the Council's uh, approach to climate change because I, as you can hear from Ian there and Maria, cannot think of a more important agenda for us all to kind of get our teeth into and tackle. And what I'm really impressed with uh, about the events tonight are that people have actually taken the time out and read those things. So that is really warm, uh, heartwarming for me, particularly for businesses who will need to be at the lead for this. So the what I'm going to do to start with is kind of uh, show you a short video. So that's a little bit of a cop out so I can take a breath from Ian and Maria. Um, and um, after that, we'll I'll go through some slides with you if that's OK. Thank you for that. That's uh, 
we're back on stream now, so I can, I can put my presentation up. That'd be great. So, so in my discussions with lead members, um, lead members have made it absolutely. Uh, well, and don't that play with it. Yes, it could, could be. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> what can you say with that? Happy days. Uh, so in my discussions with lead members, um, members made it absolutely clear to me that they wanted actions, not words. They wanted something that's going to have a real impact on local residents. And they wanted to kind of have an impact on the environment in which we work, we live. Like all organisations, these uh, actions need to be able to be funded and financed, and that's going to be an important aspect of the review of the plan over the next year. So we needed to identify the most important priorities for us and, uh, and commit as an organisation to reduce our carbon in our own organisation. But we also have to celebrate what we've done already. So you've heard some important things uh, tonight about our colleagues um, from Quantum and DICAM, but it's also important for us to get that message out to the community by giving examples to people about what businesses are doing, what the council's doing, what the voluntary sector are doing. So we need to have those examples that everybody can see. And to do this, we needed to have a clear action plan. And in our Hovering Climate Change Action Plan, we've got that, that's available on the website. You'll be pleased to know that I won't bore you with all 121 actions, although if you look at me and don't laugh at my jokes, I might. Um, so the plan will be reviewed annually. So we set it out deliberately in that way so that at the first year we kind of set some milestones, set some actions and 121 of those. And this year with our new uh, council administration, we'll be reviewing those actions and hopefully involving yourselves, set some, some new actions within the council so that those priorities can be consulted upon widely as, as Ian has described. Now as businesses, um, your friends, families, colleagues will also be interested in climate change. And again, you've heard today people who've actually taken a real interest looking at the Committee on Climate Change, looking at the reports and people, there is an interest in climate across the uh, across the um, organisation. Howard, what happened to my sli sli slides? Up? I don't know, have we got mixed slides? Yeah, so it, that would be a good idea. So if we can just go to slide two, that would be fine. So. London Councils, I thought it'd be helpful just to kind of give you some context. Uh, London Council's poll findings on the slide are self-explanatory and they show 87% of Londoners are motivated to help uh, tackle climate change. These are, as I said earlier, your customers, friends and families, and they're likely to be as concerned. And again, you will all employ residents and uh, local residents who live, work, live and work in the borough. So it's important that we get that message out uh, to those residents. Havering residents will be essential and key partners in delivering our aspirations about climate change. Oh, if we can just turn over the slide. So our work has to be evidence based. BASE, you've heard earlier about BASE, that's the Business Energy and Industrial Strategy Department of Government, for those of you who don't know, produce figures annually about carbon emissions in the locality. And they do that for all local authorities. And using this data, and putting it into a chart is helpful as it provides us an at a glance view of how we're moving. I suspect that many authorities don't use that data and they use other sets of data, but this is the publicly produced data. Quite clearly the data here, which may or may not be able to see very easily, shows that the public sector is the smallest emitter. That's good news for the council. No, no round of applause there. However, um, the, despite this, the, the council has a leadership role and the council um, has committed to reduce its emissions um, even further so that we can have a smaller amount on the top there. This is a positive spin-off in that the council can develop actions and strategies which we can share with others, including businesses, the voluntary sector and local residents. It is as this is a time series set of data, you can see that the trend in total carbon emissions is down. Um, and in part, this is linked to the greener electricity that the nation is investing in. You can also see that the biggest emitters within Havering, and this is, we've taken the data from Havering, but I can do it for other boroughs if people are interested. You can see that the largest emitters there are transportation and domestic housing sectors. Um, and although you look at the chart, I think it looks like the transport emissions have sort of plateaued, the others are coming down. 
But our data doesn't stop there. I'm not going to bore you with more charts and PowerPoint you to death. Um, but we have some really good analysis where we are spending our money. For example, on street lighting, we have exact details of what our street lighting is emitting, how we kind of reduce the figures on that. The heating within schools, the electricity within schools, the, the bills that are coming into the schools. We also monitor very closely the fuel within our vehicles and our kind of fleet. The council has a large fleet of, uh, of um, uh, vehicle fleet. And in addition, we're looking at our EPC ratings of our housing stock within the boroughs. So the council owns around about 9,000 properties, 2,000 uh, leaseholders, but there are another 100 and odd thousand properties out there as described by Ian in the private sector. So the data allows us to make evidence-based investments, which will reduce the council's running costs. And as businesses, I think that's something you'll all be interested in as well. Um, it also help your workers who may be living in the borough reduce their fuel costs. As Ian's described, the cost of fuel is, is rising and there's more fuel poverty. But if we can get grants within the borough to help people, your workers, that will help. So it's going to be for us day to day to data. And we're happy to share our lessons with companies, businesses, the voluntary sector to get the message out into the community, as Ian uh, uh, has said. And I'll give you an example from our street lighting. I mean, the council invested in uh, putting in LED lighting and LED, LED bulbs. Now 97% of the council street lights run on LED bulbs. However, that saved us around about half a million pound a year based on last year's costs. So if we looked at this year's costs, it would be even more significant. We shouldn't stop there, so we need to look at how we can again reduce our street lighting by linking into dimming efforts, explaining to communities about when lights can be uh, used and possibly um, the number of lights per street, because they're all part of our bottom line. And as I say, businesses have uh, employees who live and work in the bar. And the council, Haven Council, and I know that Barkin and Dagenham, who are represented here tonight, have also kind of been successful in applying for funding. So we've got funding of about £719,000 to spend on the private sector stock. So that money, will, although money won't come into the council, it will be used by owner occupiers and by people in the private rented se sector to improve the insulation on their building, uh, buildings. You will have workers who may benefit from that as well with some of our public sector partners, such as the hospitals. There's another £2.6 million that we've applied for, which is in the pipeline, and we're waiting for an announcement on that shortly. But that is targeted at homes that, as uh, Ian and Maria have said, that have an EPC rating of D and below. Uh, we've lot, as a council, we've logged all 32,000 um, EPC ratings that are in the borough on the council's website. They're publicly available. We stole them from the government and we stuck them into our uh, data sets. And they're generally uh, kind of available, these grants, to people who have 30,000 pounds a year or less income, although there is some kind of scope for housing costs to be incorporated in that. But the details for that are on the council's website. So if you have members of staff who are interested in that, uh, refer them to our website. But there is a barrier to us spending that level of funding. There's a significant amount of money, and this is where businesses uh, can step up. Um, because we don't have enough retrofit assessors to assess the buildings. We don't have enough installers to install all of the uh, requirements in those buildings. Um, and nationally, we are struggling with that. So we need as a council to discuss with the colleges, with other councils, with other uh, partners and with businesses, how we can kind of skill the workforce up, what the kind of glut is and how we can spend that money because the money is there. And I'm pleased to say, and uh, I won't say this too too loudly in front of my colleagues from um, Barkin and Dagenham, but Havering are being held up as an example of good practice on how to get the job done. Happy to have that as a question later on what that means. If you can move on to the next slide, please, Henry. Henry. Time, I've got very limited time. I believe they call that the shepherd's hook. <laughs> um, uh, so, so I want to give you some quick context for the uh, the Havering Climate Change Action Plan. Obviously, the council has a statutory duty. It's commitment to local bodies, regional bodies, in terms of kind of reducing its ve uh, vehicles and emissions within the borough. Um, and in, in, 20, in August 2021, the council announced its intentions to be carbon neutral by 2040. That's for its own own estate. And that is incorporated within the Haven Climate Change Action Plan. Because this is complex, we've broken it down into nine work streams. 
and we have a header service leading those. The, the actions are available on our website so people can have a look at those. But what we would look for from businesses is to come up with ideas uh, about what actions you would like to see from us in the coming year and we can discuss those with with members. So if I'm going to move on to the next slide because Howard's going to give me the shepherd's hook. Um, one of the things that we did do last year or this year, earlier this year, is invest in a company called Uma, Unomia. It's a, a bit of a dull read, but there's a on our website, there's a business decarbonisation re, uh, report. Uh, we, we commissioned Umonia, Unomia to um, look at the different sectors of businesses that operated within Havering and to identify resources that may be available to businesses to see how they can run their businesses better, how the, uh, the, what grants might be available. It will give you leads on where to go to. It's not a read from cover to cover, unlike the Climate Change Committee report. This is one where you could say, here are some links. These are the places you could go to find out some ideas. So if we can go on to the next slide, um, I'm just going to summarise if where we are. So how can the help, help council help? I mean, this is an area of public interest. Your customers will be interested in this area. Um, and so it's going to be important to all businesses. It is complex. It's fundamentally interconnected and the technology and the, uh, and the changing requirements are changing very fast and it's very difficult to keep up uh, where we are. So that we hope the council can help businesses by working with local colleges to look at what skills are available, what kind of training might be available, what the mayor can offer in relation to that, to enable businesses to access and benefit from the huge government uh, investment um, and um, provide, provide more sustainable options. So I welcome the opportunity this evening to um, uh, discuss what ideas you might have before Howard, who's probably holding my knee at the moment, uh, <laughs> keeps me quiet because I could go on for quite a lot of time. No, it's not for your knee. Yeah. <laughs> But I will take the microphone. Thank you very much. Um, I was uh, anxious um, as you were speaking, not that it wasn't really, really interesting, um, but the, the most important people in the room uh, on not the speakers, but the people who have uh, kind of sat, sat in the audience on the other end, other end of our connection. I didn't want us to leave here tonight in 28 minutes time and not having given um, our participants who've given up 90 minutes of their uh, uh, of their Tuesday evening to engage in this really important um, uh, important debate. Um, can I remind you both in the audience here uh, in Raynham and at home, um, slido.com is the place to put your uh, questions and comments. Um, we did have three questions which we were going to ask you. Um, I don't think we'll now do that. I think we'll go straight to uh, the questions um, both from the floor and on uh, on Slido. Um, I have a question and I know this because it was from me <laughs> um, uh, for Lloyd. If I'll just quickly remind myself what it was. So a question to Lloyd. Um, did you seek external support for the work you did or did you do the legwork yourselves? Yeah, so it's, it, it is a good question, and um, I thought uh, so. <laughs> no doubt, um, I, we did. Uh, we had a we brought an intern in uh, because there, you know, some uh, it was above and beyond uh, kind of the daily activities. But for the most part, uh, it was the intern assisting uh, the team uh, in doing it. So we didn't bring in expertise. Uh, we brought some, you know, uh, legs and arms and and uh, a mind, but but we did a lot of the the work on our own. Um, I, I will say, uh, for us, the the starting point was to make sure that we, uh, as a company, were committed to it. Um, so one of the things I did as a as a, it's kind of a jumping off point was to find out from everybody in the team. Uh, what their highest priorities were in terms of non-business activities. Um, and uh, uh, this a number of things came out of it, but sustainability was was on the top three of every member of the team. And so that gave us a catalyst for focusing on this, people, getting people's you know minds and hearts uh, dedicated to it, uh, such that we could bring in an intern to do some 
like basic legwork for it, uh, but the entire team was involved in uh, helping us understand the measurements, uh, obviously collecting data because we're home workers. And so a lot of the data came from people themselves um, and helping to put that together and focus on plans for reduction uh, and offsetting. Thanks for that, um, Lloyd. Uh, the other question is also from me, uh, but I, I'm not going to ask you straight away. I'm going to invite questions from the uh, from the floor. Um, so anybody have, have any questions for Lloyd, Maria? Oh, Paul, I think you got there first. Sorry, madam. <laughs> A uh, question there from uh, from Paul um, from Haven Haven Council's point of view. What is a green skill? I'm going to I'm going to pass mistake. that one to, yeah, to Nick. Uh, you knew that, didn't you? Yeah. Well, I, Thank you. Yeah, so a, a, an interesting question because it's something that we've been looking at in terms of um, where do we pitch things? So it can be a range of things for us uh, as an organisation. And again, I've got to kind of discuss this through with the lead members, but it does range from the technical skills that we've heard about today, about delivery and of, of things. But when you look at the kind of data that we put up on the board, it's also about skills for the community because we've got to spread the message amongst the community. It's about behavioural change amongst people. So they're kind of different skills out, including things like pond scraping and courses like that. There are things that the community want to get involved in. There are things that the uh, voluntary sector are getting involved in, but they need to be skilled on that. So you can kind of chunk it up into the technical skills and the reskilling, the kind of community type of skills, and then there's the data management. So I think it's really important to understand the journey that we need to be on to tackle climate change. And again, when I look at a skills academy, it can be a range of things from practical skill training, as has been at this wonderful establishment, through to uh, more kind of online training. And for example, I gave you earlier about um, uh, the retrofit assessors. That's an online type of skill. So we need to try and kind of make some sense out of it. We need to prioritise those skills that we need in the local community, but we also need to raise everybody's awareness because the council by itself is not going to make this happen. Businesses by themselves are not going to make this happen. It has to be a job that we do together and we will be welcoming views from businesses, the colleges, the mayor for London, our local members about how we kind of define those skills and how we tailor those to the local area. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Put me on the spot again, yes. 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 Wow. For example, Yes, I mean, um, what I didn't get a chance to say is we've got an 18 year pro plan here. It's an 18 year program. Do you want to brief the, uh, the audience out there at home as to what Paul had to say? Because they ah. wouldn't necessarily have heard uh, heard what his question was. Uh, what, to summarise it? Yeah, Paul, what Paul I think said was um, how do we um, uh, look at the skills that are required for the built environment in terms of regeneration and what the priorities for those would be. Um, and I think the, the important thing for me there is it's sector by sector. The council and the colleges and the investment across London will need to be led by businesses in consultation with uh, those companies because tackling climate change, as you've seen from our petal diagram or our work stream diagram, is massive. You might ask about the built environment today. Um, somebody else is going to talk to me about electric cars tomorrow. Um, and it, it, it is so wide ranging. But getting a handle on the data for that is, all, is also important. And it's about kind of retraining some of the people who have existing jobs, as we've looked at here in Quantum, to say, what are the skills for the future? And in a sense, we're kind of in this standoff at the moment where the colleges need to be thinking about what is a viable course and what is a, a something that the business sector will will require. And I think there's that kind of standoff. We need that bridge that gap 
and the public sector will need to kind of think about how to do that very very carefully because there is a kind of a, a standoff period at the moment between what is going to work and how do we take it forward i am not the skills expert having said that i was meeting today uh, with um, uh, somebody who's working across east london um, who are holding a business event later this month and i will give the um, details for the for the link in there so that your views on that can be fed directly into the person who's coordinating that for eight or nine boroughs I think Maria Ganella, uh, sitting two people to my left, is pretty skilled in the skills field at the moment, who's probably doing more for skills development in this field than uh, than anybody else. Um, I, I am going to hand. Um, no, first of all, can I ask a question uh, of a member of the audience, uh, Janet Smith? Are you still with us uh, there? I wonder if you'd like to make a comment on the role of the chamber in shaping this agenda. Are you able to come in on that? If you're wishing to come in, oh, you've come off mute. Hi, Janet. Hi. Could you? I don't know if you could hear me on this. Could you? Yeah, we can hear you uh, perfectly. Amazing, amazing technology. Ah, uh, yeah. But I mean, yeah. I mean, this is something we really want to get behind. Um, we're very, very keen to to engage with our local businesses and, and Havering Council on this. And I think that something that you know is coming to mind though is that. Generally, you know, the business we're working with, um, you know, their focus is on survival. You know, they, they, they need to, to to make money. They need to, to sort of be proactive in that area, and it's finding the balance with that in spending time on on the bigger issues in terms of the um, you know the green issues. So. It, and, and when I speak to them, you know what they're saying is, you know, we just haven't got time to be to be doing all this, and it's going to cost us more money to do it. So it's finding a way that they can um, be incentivised to 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 bring, be on board with that, um, and not to be most demotivated because, in the short term, they feel like they're going to be losing money um, and and not be, be able to sort of compete in terms of their um, you know, efficiencies with other businesses. So I think that that's where you know, our struggles are in that we need um, to know how, how can you know, Havering Council give that to our local businesses in terms of support um, and you know, signpost them in the best way. You know, a conversation I had the other day with a business was it it took them so long to work out how to get a you know an electric van um, and you know where to sort of source that from and and how that was going to work with, with their business. Was there any funding or grants or anything like that out there? The information wasn't there available. Um, so I think that they're the things that we need to, some some sort of work on really. Thanks for those uh, thoughts, Janet. Um, can I ask you just to go back on mute so then we don't get feedback Ooh, in the room? Goodness. Sorry, I'm not asking you to oh, shut up. Um, uh, so thank you for those. <laughs> yeah, thank you for those uh, uh, for those thoughts. You did ask a question about incentives being offered by the uh, the council. Um, you know that just as these are tough times for um, uh, for businesses, it's tough times for the public sector as well, with a 15 million pound budget gap to uh, to to meet in the next six months alone. And once we've done that, the same again uh, next year. So these aren't easy times, but you know that. Um, under uh, Nick's stewardship, we will be seeking to bring in external resources where we can. Uh, you, I think uh, you also asked a second question about trusted sources of advice. And you touched on this in your comments a few seconds ago. Um, I've got people within the inclusive growth team who are uh, looking right now uh, at identifying those trusted sources of, sources of advice and bringing our own website uh, up to date where we can start to share uh, that good practice um so uh, keep um, uh, keep your eyes on that uh, on that website over the coming months as we bring it uh, up to date i am going to pass back to um to nick um because there's a question here for for nick it's, it's not me dropping you in it it's a questioner dropping you in it um how do havering havering council engage with owner occupiers in the borough regarding carbon reduction 
So in terms of uh, the current plans, um, we have a green forum which uh, people from all, all residents in Havering are welcome to join. There's a meeting going on tomorrow night where you'll probably hear a very similar presentation from yours truly. Um, I think then the, the other issue about owner occupiers is um, uh, making sure that we raise awareness. At the end of the day, the council won't be able to do everything, um, but what a council can do, and it's got a very good tradition of uh, managing the stewardship of its environments, our parks and the environment, we want to protect that. But that is then an opportunity for the council to promote the actions that people will need to change. People like myself need to change the way uh, we behave and what we do. That is a, pe a choice for people and um, for our, our role is to promote that and make sure that our business, the council's business, is run efficiently and can be used as examples of, of what we're doing. We have also, in terms of owner occupiers and not just necessarily um, residents, but we do employ a number of people within the borough and we have an environmental staff forum. So it's about culture change from within our organisation as well, so that we share those lessons and we have ambassadors out there. And we've also got a climate change um, uh, working group of residents who are volunteers to go out there and spread the message because it's much better to get a message from from your friend, your neighbour, your 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 col uh, your your resident, your colleague than it is from uh, from me as a, an officer sitting here preaching what should be happening. I hope that's answered a bit of the question. Yeah, it has. I'm just looking at the next question, um, uh, Nick, and then I'll come to the lady um, in, yes. in row three in uh, in just a second. Um, the following question was also from Nick, but that was from GIS chat. I think we've covered we've co we've covered that one in uh, in, uh, in conversation. Um, yeah, so it's strategy for properties with very low EPC ratings. Yeah, uh, so there's uh, there's a number of uh, uh, asks there. In terms of uh, the way the council approaches EPC ratings, EPC ratings are very kind of fluid. Uh, they only kind of come in uh, to effect when somebody either buys or sells a house or rents a house. So the problem becomes that somebody moves in, they then kind of upgrade their house. I think everybody does that. So what we need to do is to reach out to those people who haven't got EPC ratings and to reach out to private sector landlords. And the way the council is doing that is through its landlord forum, plus also the way it commissions uh, services. The council rents properties uh, to help people in, uh, in need uh, from the private sector and we are approaching that by saying, uh, as, as was described earlier by Maria, uh, by kind of saying we're not going to be taking any on that are not got an EPC rating of C or above. So we just, but we do need to work with landlords to say here are some grants that are available for you to improve those. The grants for landlords are slightly different insofar as the landlords have to pay 50%. The grants for owner occupiers who are under £30,000 and have an EPC rating of D and below are free um, in terms of there are no comebacks on those for residents. There's a maximum spend of £10,000, but there is a little bit of flexibility in that. And again, I'll come back to the point, we've spent £800,000 of the £720,000 allocated to uh, the council. You can see the maths problem there, um, but it's luckily that's the government's money and they were underspending it. So we've now managed to kind of take up some slack that they had elsewhere. Um, those schemes are happening as we talk and those will be uh, the residents that are out there. So the whole stock as well, um, isn't necessarily it's split up into different sectors. So we also have, um, we need to work with the regist registered social landlords because they will have their own investment plans as well. But it's not just for the council to be saying this sector or that sector, but it's about for us working together and sharing the lessons. We've got to have an open book policy on that. And equally, when we started to analyze the data, which is out there and we've been and spoken to Eon as well, the wealthiest families are the ones who are probably using the most energy. So it's not. we've also got to then get the message out to those families who live in the richer properties. Actually, this is about also changing your behaviours because it affects us all. Um, so we do need to have an, a, a, an attack to help those people who may be facing uh, issues with their fuel bills. But we also have to talk to the people who have the larger houses who could run their properties in a slightly different way. So it's not an all or nothing. Getting that message out there is really important to kind of engage with a wider group of people. Shut up, Nick. 
<laughs> Madam, we have a question from the floor, which you may have the microphone for if you wish. Right, shout. I, I'm there may well be different calls for action from 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 different speakers. I know Lloyd has been very kind in uh, in sharing his uh, experience, um, but there may well be different calls from uh, from uh, from Dykin, from Quantum. I know from Nick's point of view, he's working on the uh, on the the next one year um, uh, delivery plan as part of the, uh, the the climate change action plan. So he wants to engage with you. Uh, you know, gone of the days I think when local businesses are you, are you in business likely madam or? <laughs> right okay thank you for that um uh, so um notwithstanding that we still want to uh, to engage with you in the production of the uh, uh, the next phase of that strategy uh in that um gone are the days when a local council can do when 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 you can become a victim of the things which we think are best for you but this is a problem that we share it's only through collective action that we can make an impact of the scale that we need. Um, do you want to add anything to, to that, Nick? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a good question. And um, what do I want? I want it all. Um, so I do want you to be able to say to us, what are the actions that we you think we should be doing? Because no one person is better than all of us. You will understand from your particular sectors, whatever wherever you're coming from, what we need to do and we need to listen. We need to uh, populate that. I mean, it's, it's a shame that Ian lives in, in, in Wales because what we do need to do is have an understanding and have people with enthusiasm who look at this. What the, the diagram I didn't get to kind of share with you is massive. And we, what we need to do is to say, what are our priorities? Some of the things that will affect the businesses and companies out there are the business continuity petal, which might be how do you deal with the flooding? How do you deal with the, the heat going up? There are things that you can do in London. So I'll give a shout out to SLM, Sports and Leisure Management, who manage our, our leisure centres. At the moment, that's, that's the one. Yeah. Uh, they, at the moment, um, uh, London uh, is kind of going through some hot periods and some of the businesses have been invited to kind of create cool places. It's, you know, this is a simple thing that people can do, get the message out to the community. Maybe the bids can help with those kind of areas. If people are walking through Romford, where do you sit down, get a free glass of water and kind of cool off. Those kind of things we need to kind of be aware of. The difficulty the council has, and this is the, is the knowledge management on this, is it's massive. So every day I must have 50 emails from different courses you could go to, different events you could go to. Um, and I, I kind of sympathise with what was said earlier about where do you go to to kind of identify the best vehicle. It is a problem. We can share what we're finding out as a council. We've got to have an open book on that. And that's what I'll be recommending to the powers that be. But we also need to kind of be uh, 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 inquisitive is a probably a, the right way of saying what is it I can do because the business sector there are some fantastic opportunities here in terms of investment and money coming out I mean I read it I read in one of the newspapers that the uh, green sector which kind of ranges there is four times bigger than the manufacturing sector because it goes from waste to transport to business continuity to working on the built environment all those things are here the one thing I would say I'm not an expert on all of them and that's why you need to kind of have a conversation with those people who are the experts to come in here. I can kind of sit here and waffle on about transport. That's not the right answer. We have got an, a, a team of people who are looking at active travel. We have got a team of people who are trying to encourage people in, in Howard's area to look at social enterprises, last mile deliveries. But if you've got an idea, then come to us. And then I think the other thing I would say is that the Havering Museum held a business event and we had some really interesting local companies. We had the Pantry Shelf and the Happy Hedgehogs who came out there and, and they've kind of described to me things. I'm thinking, actually, why am I not doing that? 
and that's supporting a local company, two local companies around here. Um, one's the, the, the uh, pantry shelf does refillable cereals. Now, there's no reason that they couldn't come to your businesses, to your places of work and kind of produce those kind of goods because they do it from an electric vehicle and they kind of uh, uh, and then they could give it to your your workers there and then or your colleges, should I say. But it's about kind of getting that ecosystem of that knowledge out there. And it's it's a job for us all. It's not if you're looking to me to do it, forget it. Um, it it's it is a job for everybody, and we've got to do that together. Maybe I'm reasonable for me to say, but there you go. And uh, yeah, I was about to pass over to Marie. I'm just going to say, I think for for me, the main um, progress here will be green skills. Um, I have been working very closely with NCC. Um, as you probably know, they are the largest construction campus in Greater London. It was a shame you missed the opening because I actually did mention you in the opening um, how lucky we are to have the largest construction campus. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh sorry, sorry. Um, we're so lucky to have them. Um, we're so lucky to have the largest construction campus up the road from us. So what we've been doing sort of behind the scenes, um, uh, obviously with Alison from NCC, because obviously we need to take it further. We need to actually get it into the state system. Um, at the moment, there's nothing written on the MVQ module. So we've actually got a meeting in the next two weeks with the GLA, with Alison. Alison wants to trial it. Let's be the first in London to get it into the NVQ because that's what needs to happen. Um, we've got so many people um, that need upskilling. So that's fine. We're here for that. It's, uh, it's basically for those that are already in the trade, the facility that we have, is perfect for them but it's not perfect for the for the younger generation and they're the ones that need upskilling um, so this is why we, we, we need to get the ball rolling Daikin are on board with it um, and we're going to get we're getting going with it your passion impresses me <laughs> in this, uh, uh, on this agenda yeah do you want to say a few words in yeah just quickly I mean I mean it's a it's a, it's a really good question I think from my point of view um, what are we looking for I think obviously my my area of business, if you like, is is heating, cooling, and all that sort of stuff. But um, I think whichever area of business you're in, what I'm looking for is um, Maria mentioned it's 135,000 women and heating companies or engineers out there, and, and I was one of those. And you have consumers or small businesses contacting those to say, I need a new heating system, or I need a new cooling system, or I need whatever it is, and the majority of those companies will still go there and say, well, you need a new boiler. And nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I really want a new boiler. They want heating and hot water. That's what they want. And everybody assumes that's what provides it. It's not, it's 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 really not what can provide it anymore. Um, and what I'm looking for is, 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 is businesses just to take that approach that if I can offer an alternative, which the majority of them don't at the moment, so I can go to that small business or to that home uh, owner occupying yeah of course i can give you a new boiler however what about this as an option because if without putting those options on the table people are not getting to know about those options what it also does is if, if i go and quote a boiler and i'm just talking about my sector now there's 134,999 other companies who can do exactly the same if i go and quote something else there's probably about 1299 and probably not many in this part of the world um so from a going back to janet's point from a business point of view absolutely that the whole low carbon agenda needs to be driven by businesses who need to make profit to survive etc that has to happen there's huge opportunities out there for businesses, particularly now, um, to really to do that. And and so it's not just let's greenwash everything and make it all fluffy. And you know there is there's business to be done and there's there's profit to be made. You know if you do it properly. And and really what all I'm looking for is those businesses to put that option on the table. But to be able to do that, you need to understand how that works. You need to be skillful enough to if somebody actually takes you up on it, you can do it, etc. And then more specifically for us, you know, we're working with Quantum to provide that training because it is a it is a barrier. Uh, and even more specifically for that, which which Quantum don't currently do, maybe we'll be able to do in the future. We are looking to partner with colleges who can provide like FGAS qualifications because we don't we can't do that. Um, and so that's a really specific one, but that's you know that's something that we're looking for as well. Ian, that's uh, great. We're down to our last two minutes. So any any burning issues from the uh, from the floor before we go uh, our separate ways? Did you put your finger up then? 
No, I was just thinking you said Birmingham. Right, OK. <laughs> Chris. We are driving to the company now for our sales and product. Solar. Take as little off the grid as you possibly can. Because I know what people are paying for energy prices now, like 10, 12, I need to summarise this, Chris, for the for the for the for, for the for the for the for the for the people at home. So this is Chris Chris Canella, uh, director of uh, of Quantum, is um, uh, reminding us that um, um, uh, 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 air source heat recovery uh, is seventy five percent cheaper than uh, than uh, just using energy straight from the straight from the grid uh, as point. A and point to B was that uh, we need to be drawing as little from the grid uh, as, as possible. I've oh, summed it up OK. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> any more for any more? Before I say thank you to our audience at home, thank you. Um, before I say thank you to Chris and Maria for, uh, for hosting this evening, uh, to our guests, um, Ian Bevan from uh, from Dakin, um, uh, Nick Kingham from Havering, from our uh, very skilled uh, uh, technical team, uh, Dan Moore and Henry Salvini, uh, and to uh, Lloyd Clark of uh, Can Digital for uh, his presentation earlier on the evening. Grateful to you all. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your commitment to this really important uh, agenda. We look forward to continuing that work with you uh, in the future. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. <laughs>